You're listening to the official OSAP podcast with Michelle Lee, bringing you infection control tips and information to make you a safer practicing clinician. And now here's your host, Michelle Lee. Hello, and welcome back to OSAP's podcast. I'm Michelle Lee, and I am so excited today to have with me um, someone that has become a friend during the pandemic, jo- uh, Dr. Joanne Garillion. And let me tell you a little bit about um, Joanne. She is a professor and a graduate program director in the Department of Dental Hygiene at Idaho State University. She is past president of both Uh, the International Federation of Dental Hygienists and the American Dental Hygienists Association. And this past year, she led ADHA's COVID-19 task force. And most recently, and this is the reason I have her here with me today, she was part of the research team, um, the collaborative research team between ADHA and ADA that took a close look at the impact of COVID-19 on dental hygienists. Um, So welcome, Joanne. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be here with you today. Oh, it's so always great to talk with you. Um, so let's start with the good news uh, that came out of this study. I was, I, I'm going to tell, and, and I want everybody to know, they held these results very tight. I wanted to know for weeks what these results were, and I couldn't find out. So I was so excited when the study was released. Um, and, and the result is the rate of dental hygienists having COVID-19 is uh, very low. It is, Michelle. We were so excited to see these results because I think everyone wanted to know, is it safe to be part of a dental practice? Are our dental team members safe? And we knew early on that the studies that the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute were conducting had shown that dentists had a very low COVID infection rate, and that was exciting news to report out. And then um, the American Dental Hygienists Association was able to partner with the ADA HPI and start looking at dental hygienists. And we were waiting too, Michelle. We all (laughs) wanted to know what were those results for dental hygienists. And let me just put a shout out to all our dental hygiene colleagues who agreed to participate in this study. Um, This is our first National Study of U.S. Dental Hygienists, and we were lucky to have almost 4,800 dental hygienists sign on for the study and bless their hearts for, you know, month after month participating and giving us this unique data set. And what we learned is that, yes, we had, I think it was 3.1% of dental hygienists who reported a COVID positive um, test result and not all associated with being part of a dental practice setting. So that's even the better news Mm -hmm. of the result. Um, And what it tells us is this finding is comparable with the general population, but less than other healthcare workers. And so we know that the dental practice team is doing all of the right things that we need them to do. And patients can be confident when they are going to their dental practice setting, that things are working for them, that we are implementing safe practices for them and really giving them the highest standards we can for providing oral health care. Isn't that a wonderful finding? It's a wonderful thing. And, you know, I, and, and I know a lot of people have, have made this point um, during this pandemic. It's, it's, um, oral health care has been on top of infection control for since the 80s, you know, when when we had to deal with um, HIV and AIDS for the first time. And so they, they, they took the right steps, started following the interim guidance. And, and I know, um, and, and this for me, again, was just such a positive report because um, and I know you received phone calls. I remember OSAP, we were receiving phone calls in those early days of the pandemic from dental hygienists who were very, very scared and very nervous about going back into the office. And, uh, you know, and, and I just think that um, I'm thankful for the, the CDC Division of Oral Health and, and a lot of the OSAP subject matter experts who all joined together and ADHA, your team all came together to make sure that 
we were looking at everything that needed to be done in this new environment. Well, Michelle, I think one of the things that is so exciting about this information for us is that in the beginning, we looked at this and everyone was so worried about COVID and this virus is not behaving like others that we know. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a scary virus. People die from this and it doesn't matter who you are. The virus doesn't say, well, I won't go to Michelle or Joanne. I'll pick somebody else. Yes. Um, this virus just is horrifying in so many ways. And so we, people were right to be afraid. Mm -hmm. um, they were right to look at this and say, I have a comorbidity. Maybe I should step away and take care of myself and my family. They were right to make good choices in mm -hmm. all settings. But at the same point in time, as you mentioned in the 80s, we stepped back with HIV and said, well, we have to take precautions. We have to glove, we have to wear masks and we have to adapt. We adapted to COVID-19. We mm -hmm. put in precautions. We looked at recommendations from the CDC, from OSHA, from OSAP, and we made adaptations that were important to make to, to be mindful of this virulent situation. Mm -hmm. And in effect, what we showed is that our steps that we took were working, were effective and were appropriate. And in the beginning, it was serious. It was a significant change. And you know, practices closed and had to regroup, mm -hmm. but at the same point in time, the steps that were taken were well worth it because look yes. at where we are now. You right. know, many practices are back up and running. They're different for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just had my dental hygiene appointment. It's a different scenario. Yes, it is. I don't mind that scenario. I'm actually very accepting of it and somewhat assured that things are going well. And I think that hygienists and dentists and all of the other dental team members should be proud of what they have done and, and should be lauded for the steps that they have taken because it is making a difference for everyone. Yes, it definitely is. How, how, much, um, how much of the interim guidance do you believe is here to stay? I have to say, I think much of the interim guidance is here to stay. Now, I know that for some people, the hardest part, of course, in our hygiene world is the CDC recommendation to avoid aerosol generating procedures. And so for us, that is, I would say, a hardship. You know, not Absolutely. using ultrasonics, not polishing. These are things we're, it's built around our world. And so I do think that those recommendations will change mm -hmm. you know we have vaccines that are going on right. now and we have another vaccine that has emergency use authorization yes the predictions are that maybe by the summertime many individuals will be vaccinated and so i think when we get closer to herd immunity some of those things mm -hmm. will be lifted those restrictions will change for us and we can get back to doing more of the procedures we're used to but others, I think, are going to stay the same. I do think we are going to continue to screen our mm -hmm. patients. I do think, you know, believe it or not, we've always said vital signs are important. And we take blood pressure and, you know, we screen our patients and, and maybe we take a pulse. But temperature is a vital sign. Mm -hmm. and I always taught my students we should take all vital signs. Mm -hmm. You know, some people might be horrified at the thought that we should weigh our patients, but we have medical situations where weight is an important concern. Yeah, I'm not going to vote for the weight. Yeah, I know you probably <laughs> wouldn't. But, but there are things that we can talk about with right. our patients, and all vital signs are important. I'd like to see that continue. Um, and then, you know, wearing a mask. We've always worn masks, but mm -hmm. protecting ourselves with additional face shields, eye, eye protection, why not? These are good things that we should be doing. Absolutely. Um, you know, disinfecting our operatories. These are great things that we should be doing. Mm -hmm. So continuing those practices I see as, as relevant and appropriate, and we're not out of a pandemic. No. Not done yet. So continuing those practices, I think will be important to do. Yes. Great. So, um, um, 
one of the things um, I wanted to to ask about, and and I, I want to go back and and point out there were actually two papers that came out of this study. Um, so in this first paper, there in the conclusion statement, um, it's it says there is a need for further support for dental hygienist use of PPE and mental health. Talk to me about why that statement was included in the conclusion. So you're talking about our prevalence paper. And one of the things that we felt truly um, was important for us to do is to make sure that we were providing the best possible PPE in all dental practice settings. And what we found is that not all hygienists um, felt that they did have enough PPE um, that may be changing as we continue to monitor mm -hmm. this, because if you remember, some of these findings were from uh, from the fall. Right. We're now in the spring where PPE has changed. Yes, it has. We, we do want to look at that. But what we felt at the time is that some hygienists reported that they were not having all of the PPE that they felt they needed. And mm -hmm. and so we do want to look at that and say we, we need to monitor that. And, and are they getting all the masks and all the gowns and the gloves and everything that they need. And in some cases, what we found too was that um, they weren't always being utilized in the way that was recommended by the CDC. So we want to monitor that mm -hmm. and see what is happening now. The situation is remarkably different. You know, we've looked at optimization and yes. change may reflect, you know, the times. If right. We and then as far as mental health, we did note that hygienists reported higher levels of anxiety and depression than even their dentist colleagues, um, not as much as the general population and certainly not as much as other healthcare workers, but it is important. And, you know, agencies who have been looking at this have noted that we, the pandemic has affected everyone. I don't know anyone who is not reporting stress at right. this time. Um, we are all affected in some way. And the important thing is that we acknowledge it, that we don't try to hide or, or um, withdraw our feelings about how we are affected by this and that we seek support mm -hmm. um, in whatever way that is for everyone to, to get help if we need help. and. That doesn't mean we all have to, um, you know, put ourselves in an institution, but it may mean that we need to get counseling or mm -hmm. we, we may need to do things that are important for us, which could be as simple as taking time out for yourself. Right. And, um, doing things that give you a chance to decompress when you are feeling so much stress. And we recognize this as important and we care about what is happening with dental hygienists and all dental team members. And we want them to know that we see that this is important and we want to acknowledge it and address it as best as we can. So for dental hygienists, we say don't hide, do take time for yourself and you cannot care for all the other people that you care for if you are not taking care of yourself. And how many times do we know that and we tell everyone else, take yes. care of yourself, but we don't do it. We don't, you know, hold ourselves accountable. Right. Stop for one second. I hear noise in the background and I want to stop that noise. Okay. okay. Oh, you don't have to stop your recording. I don't. Okay. Oh, well, it's going to be a separate recording now. So, okay. Hold okay. on. Um, I'm not going to pause my recording. Just okay, I won't. I won't. I won't pause mine either. Oh, maybe I. Sh well, no, I won't. We'll just have to tell the producers. I'm sorry. That's okay. There's a lot of background noise going on in my house, and I just thought, oh, I can hear it. If I can hear it, maybe you can. Oh, yeah. I, I did I did not hear it, but that's okay. Okay. So, okay, so have you started recording again? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, okay, we'll just pick up from, from there. Okay. Again, you know, 
dental hygienists, they are, I mean, you're seeing a number of patients in a day and, and you're hearing, you know, their concerns and their stress, right? So as dental hygienists, we take on even more of that stress. So what you're saying is, is so important that we all should stop and, and especially dental hygienists and, and walk away from it for a little bit and, and do whatever to, to help their mental health. And, and I, and that's where I think too, um, you know, organized associations can come into play because that's where you can find a community of like-minded people, right? Within ADHA to support you, to share those struggles with. Um, that's how we all get through this together. I agree. And I think knowing that you're not alone, you know, there mm -hmm. are over 200,000 of us going through this experience. Yes. But I think understanding that this is, you're not unique to this situation and you're not alone and we all have these experiences. Yes. And understanding that we're a community going through this together. Um, let everyone know that you're a part of this and we understand and we share this experience with you and we want to support you. Well, so the second um, kind of leads us into this. The second paper um, really talked about the impact on unemployment with dental hygienists. And um, there's been an overall, I think it, the number is 8% reduction in um, dental hygienists. But the majority of that has been a voluntary situation. It wasn't they were all let go. Right. So we found that it was 7.9% um, of dental hygienists um, had uh, chosen to leave the workforce or they left the workforce. Let me clarify, they left the workforce. And of that, um, you know, many of the individuals, it was um, of that 7.9%, 59% left voluntarily. Mm. Um, some were let go um, or furloughed and some chose to permanently leave the workforce. And at the time, we suspected that part of this was related to the idea of COVID-19. Um, you know, some individuals we found actually had their own health concerns mm -hmm. or someone in their family had health concerns. And so they, were, they wanted to step away from practice for those kinds of reasons, they felt that they didn't want to bear the burden of bringing this viral infection home to their loved ones. And we absolutely can appreciate that concern. There were other concerns about workplace safety. And I think we all can you know, um, appreciate that if there were concerns about PPE shortages or things like that, you know, stepping away made, made them feel safer. Um, there were concerns about not wanting to work as a dental hygienist for a while or forever. Um, and there were childcare concerns. So all mm -hmm. of those things were entering into their decisions about stepping away voluntarily, or, you know, this may be my career choice to seek some other options. Mm -hmm. And so all of those things entered into the picture, but what we believe now, and we are going to look at this going forward is with the availability of vaccines, with the availability of hygienists to be vaccine administrators, might the picture change? Because for some people, it was a decision to be up on a temporary basis. And so now, you know, moving forward, will some of these hygienists choose to return to work? That 7.9% actually translates to about 18,000 dental hygienists. So it mm. sounds like a small number, but it's not a, a small lot. Number. Mm -hmm. so we want to see over time, will any of that make a difference for hygienists? Um, I've been contacted periodically by hygienists saying, I've left the workforce, but I still want to do something. What can I do? Mm. And, you know, I generate different ideas for them to say, you know, gone, but not forgotten. <laughs> like, let's, what are all other things that you can feel safe doing at right. this time? And have you thought about these other options? Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting to see the reactions because we are so um, devoted in healthcare and we love being with patients and, mm -hmm. and providing the care that we do. So I, I don't think people realize how much hygienists feel the sadness and the loss 
Oh, yes. Not providing care and wanting to be that healthcare provider again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking at other avenues and possibilities is important for dental hygienists. And as you said before, we are a community and having webinars that talk about what are, what are my options? What mm -hmm. is available to me if I'm not yet ready to return to work? If I feel like I wanna wait a little bit longer, what are some other things that I can be doing to feel that I'm still you know, a healthcare provider and still oh. valuable as a profession, as a professional. Oh, definitely. Oh, that's great. Um, so um, I, I do want to, um, I, I have one kind of final question for you. What surprised you most in this study? That's a great question. What surprised me most? I, you know, there were a couple of things that surprised me. One, I think we all were surprised at the fact that um, one in 10 reported that they didn't know how many days supplies of PPE they had, but it was part of their decision to step away from practice. Mm. And we talked about this, that there clearly was a communication issue. And if you were thinking about stepping away from practice, maybe you would have thought that you could have asked that question. Yes. You could have explored the whole issue of safety, workplace safety further. And maybe you had had conversations before. We don't know because, mm -hmm. we didn't, you know, have 20 questions following up every question that was on the survey because then no one would have completed the survey. But like somewhere in the back of our minds, we thought about that a lot and had said, you know, could there have been communication issues here that could have been addressed better? And I think we all, we can't judge that because in, when you're in the beginning of a pandemic and everybody is just crazed, you know, maybe that's a hard time for everybody to sit down and have those communication moments and talk thoroughly through everything that's going on. It's mm -hmm. a time and we acknowledge that. But we see clearly that was an area where we could have maybe sat down and said, where are we? What is right. our supply? <laughs> right, exactly. Help me po process this so I can make the decision. So that's one thing that came across. The other surprise for me and the concern, and this is me with my hat on as chair of the task force. On yes. Task work. Um, not everyone follows CDC guidance, national mm. guidance. And... So that stings a little bit for me. Um, although many practitioners, you know, employ at least five measures, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, a little more than half actually follow CDC guidance. And that was concerning to me. And because while our infection rate is low and we have a lot of good things happening in the world of infection control, and all is supportive and wonderful. Still, there were some that were not really following all the national guidance measures that we would like to see happening. And yes. we're not, we're human beings, we're not perfect. We can't explain all of this because we weren't able to answer all these follow-up questions we'd like to. It's still, that's the part where we said we still have some work to do. Absolutely. And and you know, as, as OSAP's vision, our vision is that every dental visit is a safe visit. And, you know, that's, I know, in, and you've kind of been part of it, working with a lot of people on our team as well. And, and I think that that keeps us all going because of exactly what you said, not everyone is still following all the guidance. And we, we do, we all still have more work to do and more education to do. And um, I'm just very happy that OSAP and ADHA has been able to collaborate this year to help get that message out there. Yes. Um, so I'm and very thankful for that. The one other thing that I hope my colleagues recognize is we're, we're very lucky because we're all 1As. We get vaccinated and we're fortunate, but being vaccinated doesn't mean that we can't transmit virus. So right. my hope is that we do up our game in infection control practices and following national guidance, 
because we can still be vulnerable and mm -hmm. our patients are always vulnerable to us. So the highest standards, the best practices are what we should strive for always. So, so when I see that, that one piece that is our surprise, I yes. would hope that we would remember that, you know, nothing is foolproof. We're never 100% secure and safe. And that's why we, we do practice to the highest levels that we can. So, you know, if I were to say that's the one thing that I would hope mm -hmm. that, you know, we have a little more work to do. And if I know my colleagues as dental hygienists, we always are so obsessive compulsive about everything. <laughs> we work to be the best that we can be. Um, that so, is true. Yes. So knowing this, knowing this is an area that we could do a little bit better on. I hope that we do look at that and say, okay, maybe we need to pay attention to this. And we, the one thing that I've said, and Ann and I talk about, Ann Betrell, our CEO of ADHA, we talk about this all the time. Hygienists need to recognize that they are licensed healthcare providers and they are the owners of their portion of any practice setting, no matter where they work. So they need to make good decisions in this regard. And they shouldn't palm it off on anybody else. They shouldn't defer to somebody else. They should take ownership of this and be responsible for this area and help provide improvement that makes any other practice setting that much better. So I'll Absolutely. keep that thought with you, Michelle. Well said, well said. Well, thank you so much, Joanne, for joining us. And I, I do want to let everybody know that you can um, go to ADHA.org, correct? ADHA.org. And you can um, listen to a, a wonderful webinar that um, was held uh, recently on the study um, with um, several of the um, co-writers um, of this and uh, to get all the information. So if, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it was it was fabulous. It was really walked through all the details of the study. You can also read the studies um, online and in, in, in the ADHA journal. So I do encourage you uh, to do that. And um, if you want more information about OSAP, please do visit our website, osap.org. We'd love to have you um, as a member as well. And um, until next time, get vac vaccinated and stay safe.